I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Credit Institute and especially the Global Governance Center at the Credit Institute. My name is Nico Krisch. I'm co-director of the Global Governance Center and uh, I'm very happy that we come together today uh, and discuss the important initiative on torture-free trade with Commissioner Malmström and our distinguished panelists this afternoon. This initiative uh, is one that is gathering momentum and it's carried forward by an alliance of, I think, around 60 countries, right? Initiated by the EU together with Argentina, Argentina and Mongolia in the beginning. I find this initiative fascinating, uh, not only because it pursues such a, an important goal, but it tries to help eradicating torture and capital punishment, not through condemnations and conventions outlawing them, as has been tried for decades before, but instead it tries to cut off the supplies needed for the practice uh, through what you can call a market-based approach, right? The supply is such as spiked batons, shock belts, and automatic drug injection systems. If you see the pictures, and later you might see some, uh, it's truly horrifying. But it's perhaps a sign of the times that even torture tools have become commodities, and it might indeed be more effective to tackle the stream of goods that allow for intolerable practices if those engaged in those practices cannot be moved to let go otherwise. In a sense, there's a turn from a mindset of law and prohibition to one of regulation and practical effects when it comes to implementing moral norms and requirements. Now, we've seen this in recent times in many contexts of international law and global governance, uh, curtailing the financing of terrorism is one example, the uh, arms trade treaty, another one, just to mention a few prominent one, ones. I find this initiative also fascinating because it seeks to generate momentum for a new norm by expanding bit by bit kind of a circle of like-minded states and is very effective at that. Um, for academics, this seems to be somewhat taken out of the playbook of the norm dynamics and political change literature, uh, building up support until you reach a tipping point that makes many previously uncommitted actors turn and uh, join the bandwagon. Um, now I hope that ind indeed does work this way, uh, as academics predict, but that's not always what reality really shows, um, and that the tipping point is reached relatively soon. Uh, the energy behind the project is certainly there, and we're going to hear much more about this today, but of course, many challenges still lie ahead. Now, we're particularly pleased to further inquire into the promise and problems of the initiative uh, with our guests today. On the panel, we have Barbara Bernard, uh, Secretary General of the Association for the Prevention of torture, Michael Crowley, uh, research associate at the Omega Research Foundation and the project coordinator of the Bradford, Bradford Non-Lethal Weapons Research Project in the University of Bradford, Gerald Staberock, uh, the Secretary General of the World Organization Against Torture, Andrew Clapham, colleague of mine here at the International Law Department at the Graduate Institute, and of course, Eski Yildiz, research fellow at the Global Governance Center, who is going to co-moderate with me and is really responsible for making this event happen. I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, before we turn to the panel, uh, however, we give the floor to Commissioner Malmström for an introductory keynote address. Mrs. Malmström has been European Commissioner for Trade since 2014 and was previously Commissioner for Home Affairs uh, after serving in the Swedish government. We're very happy to have you with us and in full uh, after that initial accident, uh, Commissioner. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bushra is from Damascus. Some time ago, she was sleeping with her family when the military came. They took her husband, they took her teenage sons, and they took many others from the neighborhood, the youngest only 13 years old. Eventually, uh, Bushra managed to get them free. She had to pay a bribe. And when she got them back, she saw that their teeth were broken, their thumbs were fractured, her husband's knees were permanently damaged. And today, they have left Syria uh, as, uh, as refugees, and they still endure terrible pain and humiliation. They suffer 
victims of tortures such as this one from nightmares, paranoia, sleep deprivation, emotional distress. It's a far-reaching and long-lasting trauma. And that's what torture does to you. It is meant to degrade and debate, debase one's humanity. It has no place in civilized society. And it has to be fought. And trade is one way that can contribute uh, to fight it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for organizing uh, this event about a very, very important uh, topic. Now, trade cannot do everything, but it can play its part. It is a way to promote your values and to promote change. From the European Union, we see that we can push some changes when it comes to environment, human rights, labor rights, gender, anti-corruption, engaging with our partners. And then we are joined with other partners, and we can really create a serious impact. That has been the leading, um, uh, the leading policies of our trade policies, that it also has to include uh, responsible trade, respect for our, our values. We have, as the European Union, um, ratified and implemented the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane and Degrading Treatment or Punishment. It is a crime, as you know, under international law. It cannot be, be um, justified. A systematic use of torture is a crime against humanity. So we were thinking about what can we do to spread the, the fight against this. Because as was said in the introduction today, you can quite easily assess products that have only one purpose, and that is to cause damage, to torture people. And these goods are truly horrifying. Batons with metal spikes, electric chalk belts, grabbers that seize people while electrocuting them, chemicals used for executions, even gas chambers you can buy online today. So they are goods used for purpose, death, pain. And this trade must be stopped. And we put a ban in our practice in the European Union. We have legislation prohibiting import, export, and transition. And we realized when we found two years ago that we had a fair in one of our capitals on security matters. And there was a strand there promoting batons, spike batons, and other products. And then we realized that we needed to fill that loophole. Pro, um, promotion uh, and an exhibition of products is also something that is now in our legislation. So this is good, but it's not good enough. Only an international instrument, a global one, could clearly close the circle and really stop trade on products for torture. And that is why, speaking with friends from Argentina and Mongolia, we launched two years ago at the United Nations in New York the Global Alliance to end trade in products used for torture and death penalty. We agreed to work together, set up cooperation to put an end to this trade. We agreed to cooperate to control, restrict exports, including export bans, set up a platform so that our customs could cooperate to monitor the flows and to make sure that we identify new products on the market. We agreed to give each other technical assistance to help other countries as well to put legislation in place and to exchange best practices for efficient enforcement. And this is good, but it doesn't end here. It is time now for concluding an international instrument to establish common, internationally agreed rules for the export of products used for torture or other cruel, inhumane, degrade, degrading treatment or punishment. We have experience in the United Nations system. We have the CITES, the Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species. 183 countries uh, have, have signed up to that. We also have the arms trade um, from, from 2013, the, the ATT. <clears throat> and similarly to those instruments, a treaty to ban trading goods used for torture and capital punishment could provide a binding instrument and a framework at international level. So we are now together with more than 60 countries preparing a resolution at the United Nations General Assembly to conduct first a feasibility study with different options to be discussed next year in the United Nations. It would also set up a group of experts who could look at this more closely. And of course, here in Geneva, the capital of human rights, uh, it is important to talk about these things because the vote will be in only two weeks and we call upon all countries to support the adoption of this resolution. Because spite clubs, thumb screws, gallows, electric chairs, gas chambers, banning these instruments will not put an end to torture, but it will make the torturer's life much more difficult 
and it will stop those who seek to profit from it. And that in itself is an important goal, and I am sure that together we can achieve it. So thank you for being here today. Thank you to, to uh, a fantastic panel uh, with, with huge expertise and knowledge who will contribute uh, to, to this discussion. Thank you very much, Eddie. Um, as you mentioned, we indeed have a fantastic panel and uh, different voices who are eager to talk about the uh, prospects and challenges of this initiative. And uh, before turning to the panel, I want to ask you a follow-up question. <laughs> I know this matter is close to your heart and I can sense this in the moving speech you just gave. And uh, we also sense a feeling of urgency. And I want to ask you, why this is urgent now and why now is the right time to ban these tools? Thank you. Well, there are several reasons uh, for this. Uh, first of all, it's, it's an, um, an important uh, question. Uh, as you said, I have met, like many of you, probably victims of tortures and their, their stories never cease to, to, to move me and to make me furious that we, we civilized people allow this to happen. Uh, but, but also because there is a, a momentum right now. There is a growing sense that trade is a good thing. Not everybody agrees with this, but many agree that trade can be potentially a good thing. But it has to be fair. It has to be responsible. And if trade can contribute to trade in the things we want to trade with, uh, but to prohibit things that, that actually have no other purpose than to kill or torture people, that could be a, a good thing uh, as well. And it seems, but here I am under the control of this expert, as far as, as I um, get uh, information, it seems to be increasing torture. In the, in the fight against terrorism, under that label, torture is increasing across the world. So it becomes even more urgent to put an end to this trade as well. So for all these reasons and many others, it's important to act now. I think we have a momentum. We have countries signing up from every continent and others who are looking at this uh, as well. So it's truly a global issue. And the fact that we can do this together with Mongolia and Argentina, I think, is, is terrific. It's, it's not... It, it shows that this is something that, that engages people from, from all corners uh, of the world. So that's why it's, this is the time to do it. It's already too late. Is it on? Yeah. Um, uh, all right. Uh, so thank you so much. I think uh, we get a sense of the, uh, of the initiative, the urgency, kind of the, push, the push behind it. Now we want to try to understand a little bit better you know, the context in which it operates. And I wanted to ask... Michael Crowley, uh, who has uh, researched the global trade and torture tools and the like for, for a long time. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the nature of this trade today and the range of equipment and concerns that this is tackling? Yeah, certainly. Can I um, um, yeah. use uh, the PowerPoint as well just to show you the range of uh, equipment that we've found? Okay, I'm told that I should say presentation and things will happen. <laughs> Maybe. Presentation? <laughs> ah, yes. Good. Excellent. Well, firstly, thank you, um, thank you to the Graduate Institute and ESGI for, for, for inviting me to be on this, uh, this very important uh, panel. Because uh, I think now, as the Commission has said, now is the time when we should be talking about this. Uh, there is a real process that's hopefully going to start in the, in the UN now. So, and more and more states are informed of the issue and engaged uh, about the issue and want to do something about the issue. So it's important that people in Geneva uh, are also aware of what's going on and uh, hopefully can engage as well. Anyway, um, right, the AMGA Research Foundation investigates uh, the manufacture, promotion and trade in what we call tools of torture throughout the world. And our investigations have um, uncovered a range of inherently abusive or dangerous law enforcement equipment and weapons. And this category encompasses um, a relatively narrow range of goods that are currently manufactured and promoted to the law enforcement community um, by, again, uh, a fairly limited uh, um, uh, range of companies, but they uh, are doing this, they're operating in all regions of the world. And, and such activities are, of course, completely unacceptable. Um, and the production, trade, and use of all such goods must be ended. The second category of goods that we have found and of, that are of concern are, are law enforcement equipment which can have a legitimate function, 
but which can and are readily misused for torture and other ill treatment and serious human rights violations. And this category, in contrast with the first, encompasses a broad range of goods, many of which are, are produced and traded on a significant scale by a large number of companies throughout the world. And this range of goods, we believe uh, the trade in them needs to be strictly controlled um, with no transfers authorised to correctional or law enforcement agencies likely to abuse them. Um, the, and the trade in tools of torture as uh, the commissioner said, is international in nature, with companies promoting and supplying their products to correctional and law enforcement bodies within their own countries, to states in their regions, but also to customers worldwide. And whilst global marketing, of course, is conducted via the internet, there are numerous specialised arms and security equipment trade fairs and marketing events that are regularly taking place in all regions of the world and sanctioned and facilitated by the host states. At present, unfortunately, only a minority of states regulate even part of this trade. So consequently, there is very little official state information that's publicly available concerning authorised imports, exports or transfers of law enforcement equipment between specific states and no accurate, comprehensive, publicly available global figures on the number of transfers conducted, the volume, the nature of goods transferred, nor who the recipients of these goods are. And despite the lack of official state information, I, I now want to give you a, sort of a quick uh, uh, overview, indication of the types of law enforcement and prison equipment that we've found being promoted in the international arms and security equipment marketplace. So firstly, there are uh, body-worn electroshock devices. So there's a range of uh, these devices that are specifically intended uh, for attachment to prisoners' bodies, and they can be activated by remote control. There are stun belts, uh, stun vests, and stun cuffs, and these things are sometimes worn for many hours at a time with the constant threat that they would be activated at any moment. So that's, as well as the physical pain, there's a psychological torture of this hanging over you. And uh, stun belts, for example, uh, deliver 50,000 volt shock uh, via electrodes that are placed uh, near the prisoner's kidneys. They have been manufactured by companies in the Americas, Africa and Asia, and have been promoted by companies in all regions of the world. They've been used to control prisoners in certain countries in Africa, Asia and the Americas. And of course, we believe their manufacture, trade and use should be prohibited. Um, the next range of goods are um, direct contact electroshock weapons, including shock batons, uh, stun guns, uh, stun shields, and here's some being used. Um, and these have been uh, developed and marketed by companies, again, in all world regions, specifically, specifically for law enforcement use. And again, the ability to apply extremely painful electric shocks at the push, the push of a button, and to repeatedly do this, often without leaving long-lasting, identifiable physical traces, makes them a favoured tool of torture. And uh, because um, uh, as nature, but also uh, the commercial world, abhors a vacuum, uh, new products are coming on to the marketplace all the time. Here um, are electroshock shock gloves, um, and they've been promoted by companies based in the Americas, Asia, and Europe. Uh, and there's ex yeah, examples from each region uh, there. Again, we believe that the manufactured trade and use of all law enforcement direct electroshock weapons should be prohibited. Next, uh, there are a range of uh, mechanical uh, restraints. Now, of course, certain mechanical restraints, like um, ordinary handcuffs and leg cuffs, if uh, uh, applied appropriately in conformity with international standards, notably the Nelson Mandela rules, they can be legitimately used uh, to ensure safety tension and restraint of prisoners. However, of course, they can be misused in prisons and by police throughout the world. So their trade needs uh, to be strictly controlled. But in contrast to those, uh, and despite the Nelson Mandela Rule 47, which states the use of chains, irons, or other instruments of restraint which are inherently degrading or painful should be prohibited, we've found a number of companies that manufacture a range of degrading or painful mechanical restraints. 
that severely restrict movement, some of which are likely to cause severe physical pain as well as mental suffering, and there's a risk of serious injury to the prisoner. They include, as you can see here, thumb cuffs, um, also leg irons, um, bar fetters, and these here are weighted leg cuffs. So some of these actually weigh up to eight kilograms. So what's the point of, of enclosing prisoners in uh, leg cuffs that are added weights uh, uh, only for uh, ill treatment and torture? Uh, also, we found a range of um, uh, restraint chairs, metal restraint chairs, where the prisoners are, are put in the chairs and handcuffs and sh iron shackles are, are uh, applied to them, and also restraints um, specifically designed to be bolted to prison walls, ceilings, and floors. Now, we believe that the manufacture of all these and the trade in these and the use in these inherently degrading and painful restraints should be prohibited. Um, next, uh, we found... Uh, a number of companies uh, producing uh, what we call chemical impact uh, devices. So companies from all regions of the world uh, manufacture and promote handheld kinetic impact uh, striking weapons, batons, truncheons, and also launch kinetic um, impact weapons and projectiles like plastic and rubber bullets. Now these, of course, are widely employed by law enforcement officials, mostly in public order policing, but also in places of detention. And human rights organisations have regularly documented their abuse in both custodial and extra-custodial settings to inflict unnecessary or excessive force, which in certain circumstances amounts to torture and other ill treatment, or has resulted in serious injury or death. And consequently, the trade in, in, in such devices should be stringently controlled. But furthermore, uh, and these are examples of, of, of the misuse of uh, kinetic impact weapons inside a prison. So the prisons there are lined up in rows, made to, to, to crouch down, they're stripped to the underwear, and then the guards, which is in a prison in the Americas, basically form a line and shoot uh, uh, um, a kinetic impact weapons at them, and then the footage shows uh, guards coming in and spraying uh, tear gas into the eyes of these prisoners. So the prisoners are not being violent. They, you know, they are not causing a disturbance. This is ill treatment and, 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 and torture. And, and such weapons are used to facilitate that. So, uh, but as well as those weapons, we found a range of inherently uh, abusive uh, kinetic impact weapons that are promoted mainly by Asian companies uh, to the law enforcement and correctional um, uh, uh, agencies. And obviously, you can see, they are designed to increase, not minimize, uh, the amount of pain and injury inflicted upon people. And certain types are like these here, could cause skin tearing and puncture injuries. And they include spiked batons, um, spiked shields, and spiked armour. And again, we believe that that kind of, of equipment, which is being promoted today, should not be manufactured, should not be traded, and should not be used. Uh, the last range of goods uh, that I'll briefly talk about are riot control agents, tear gas, pepper spray. And of course, they're commonly and uh, legitimately used uh, around the world for law enforcement purposes, notably for dispersing violent crowds, as well as for arrest and restraint of individuals. However, of course, they can be easily misused, including in inside prison cells and detention centres to ill-treat and torture individuals and during policing of public assemblies, potentially to fa facilitate ill-treatment and punishment on a large scale. Uh, and here's a, a, a recent example of such use uh, from a country in Asia. Uh, that, was, uh, that occurred this week. Uh, Omega has identified companies around the world that manufactures or promotes riot control agents and associated delivery mechanisms, mainly riot control um, RCA uh, grenades and cartridges, handheld irritant sprays, uh, single projectile launchers that disperse a limited amount of RCA over a relatively short distance. But also, uh, there's a growing... Um, range of systems capable of delivering far greater amounts of RCAs over wide areas or extended distances. And they include large capacity spraying devices, automatic grenade launchers, multi-barrel launchers like the one here, and uh, increasingly RCA dispersing drones. So the trade needs to, of, of this equipment needs to be stringently regulated with any RCA delivery mechanism deemed inherently inappropriate for law enforcement prohibited. 
in conclusion then, it's clear from our ongoing research that the trade in tools of torture is international in nature and currently out of control. It's a, it's a global problem requiring a global response from, from all states. And consequently, uh, Omega strongly supports the Alliance for Torture-Free Trade and the current proposals for an UNGA resolution establishing a UN process to explore development of international measures to tackle this trade. For the UN process to make a real and lasting impact upon the reality of this trade and effectively combat its role in facilitating torture around the world, it's vitally important, we believe, that the scope of the international measures to be considered should address both aspects of the trade that I uh, spoke about uh, just now. And consequently, uh, Omega strongly endorses the findings and recommendations of a previous study into this trade by the UN Special Rapporteur on, on Torture, Professor Van Boven which called on states to prohibit the manufacture and trade of, in, of inherently abusive equipment, but also control the trade in law enforcement equipment that could be readily misused for torture and ill-treatment, and explore the feasibility of an international regulatory mechanism to those ends. If the UN process is comprehensive in its scope and seeks to address these goals, then it has the real potential to facilitate effective state action in this area, to bring this trade under control and in so doing, make a highly significant contribution to the fight against cruelty and human suffering throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, indeed, it's shocking and horrifying to see that these tools are out there, and there must be something done, absolutely. Now I want to turn to Gerald, and I want you... Yes, thank you. I want you to help us situate this global ban within the broader fight against torture. Well, maybe the first point is, is it useful to go this route? And I think uh, clearly yes. Um, and I'll give you a few practical examples that I've seen over, over the last couple of months. Um, one was um, when you look at the death penalty, for example, you have difficulties in some US states to execute people because the, they're running out of the poison because the companies that produce this poison are conditioning that it's not used for, for the death penalty. So you see it can have a very practical impact. Um, is it frequent um, that these tools are used? Yes. Uh, is it eradicating torture, torture alone? Obviously not. I mean, I remember some time ago, there was a panel with Turkish activists who have been tortured. They, they showed an egg because they were tortured by a hot egg. So there's no limitation in the tools and, and the ways you can exercise cruelty. And there's no limitation in the fantasy that people and the, the imagination that people put into uh, constructing cruelty. So it will not single-handedly eradicate torture, but it can be very useful. And if you say you want to contextualize it, it is also because um, the day before yesterday, I woke up and the first news I saw was that the Brazilian president dismantled the national preventive mechanism. Um, we have an environment where torture is losing its status as a taboo. And the mere fact that you have more than 60 states uh, behind an initiative, in a way re-tabooing torture, I think is for me, as, as, as OMCT, as a global anti-torture movement, a breath of hope in some ways, um, that we can turn this around and, and get people back to understand how central the absolute prohibition on torture is. And when you say it's, it's attacking the supply chain as an innovative tool, yes, I think it's very much the case, but we should not let it sound as if this is deconnected with the existing standards we have. It is actually uh, dealing with the issue of complicity into torture. It is uh, the due diligence obligation of states to prevent torture and to become the complicit into torture. So it is grounded, I think, in the Convention Against Torture itself. And of course, we would like to see much more effort globally on complicity. We see other areas of complicity. If we have migration camps, for example, in Libya, and we detain people, we know exactly what will happen there. So it's a broader context, but it's very welcome to use the trade context. And why is it very welcome to use this trade context as well? I think because if you contextualize the fight against torture, we are in a sort of state of schizophrenia. We have an absolute prohibition, you can say, use Kogan as ergonomous, I can throw all these legal vocabulary into the room. But unlike a state that practices slavery, and I, I let aside slavery-like practices like trafficking, etc., at the moment, a state that tortures and tolerates tortures or invests into the law enforcement having the equipment to torture, that state can stay a respected member of the international community. 
And I think that is to change. And in order for that to change, we have to speak beyond the converted. I mean, torture is an absolute prohibition, but sometimes it's reduced to a humanitarian issue. And I think this initi initiative has the value of putting it out of the niche of discussion, that it concerns actually all of us, that it has to do with trade, it has to do with the rule of law, it has to do with development, it has to do with peace. So I see it as a very encouraging initiative, and just uh, as, a, as a last point, we know, and I think there you mentioned the, the, you mentioned the two categories, um, we know how powerful uh, some of the conditioning aiding law enforcement if they are abusive, for example, in countries can be. How powerful in the military context it can be that Saudi Arabia cannot receive military equipment from certain countries. So I think, again, um, while torture has many facets, I think it's a fascinating initiative and, and uh, we really thank you for taking the lead in this and we wish you all the best for, in our own interest uh, for the General Assembly. I have a follow-up question, just quickly, <laughs> if that's okay. So, from your experiences of coordinating a coalition of NGOs, how do you think the member NGOs will see the benefit of this ban? And what can one do to gain their support as well? I think they will, if I, indeed, the World Organization Against Torture is a more than 200 organization strong a civil society network against torture. And, and it's grounded in the belief that to have sustainable change on the fight against torture, you need local actors that can work on torture and that they're protected to do so. Um, and I think they will see this initiative positive. But they will also raise certain questions. They will say, yes, it's fine if you uh, deal with a trade issue. But we also want you, if I take a country where we're quite active, for example, if I take a country like Bangladesh, where you have a rapid action battalion, which is um, a counter-terrorism um, battalion that is known for massive abuse and far beyond anything that uh, deserves the label terrorism. So our partners there would tell us, yeah, that's a great first step, that's a great initiative, but it will not stop torture unless you actually stop engaging with that type of battalion. So they will say, integrate it into the broader framework. We have the EU torture guidelines, we have the EU human rights defenders guidelines. We've seen, for example, you mentioned uh, counterterrorism. We've seen that uh, many of the uh, people that work on torture in, in difficult countries like the United Arab Emirates or even in Mexico were spied by anti-terrorism spyware uh, sold by an Israeli company. Um, so they will say, yes, it's very good, but show us what it can do for us, and they will probably ask that it's integrated to, into a coherent approach that benefits them. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Baba Bernard, you, uh, you're also kind of working to, for the prevention of torture uh, with the SEO Association for the Prevention of Torture um, that you're heading. Um, what's your perspective on this initiative, right? Is it taking us far enough? Uh, what are the limitations? Is it effective enough? What other things do we need to do in order to bring it to the point where it can really help us uh, prevent torture? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for organizing this panel. Also, today is a woman strikes in, in Geneva and in Switzerland, and I hesitated. <laughs> but then I thought uh, Cecilia Masram should not be the only uh, woman on the panel. <laughs> but we now have a woman moderator as well. Uh, so, no, but just to come back to the question, yeah. From a prevention point of view, and the Association for the Prevention of Torture has been working for 40 years to, to try to prevent and work before torture is even uh, occurring. Um, this initiative is a very welcome initiative. And I think this fits very well, just to follow up on what uh, Gerald was saying, with the current obligation under the Convention Against Torture to take all measures to prevent torture at different levels, legislative, administrative, and adding the trade aspect is very, uh, is very powerful, I think. So, uh, and, and from a prevention of, of Pre prevention point of view, of course, cutting the supply, as you mentioned in your introduction, is a very uh, um, 
useful way of, of uh, not allowing uh, these, these uh, weapons to be used in, in, in torture. And we know that when they are available, they are bought and then they are used. So I think this is the first step that is really uh, necessary. But I uh, also coming back to the presentation about the two types of, of tools, one are that are exclusively used or to um, uh, provoke pain and, and, and suffering. The other one, I think, and from prevention point of view, these are the more problematic, the ones that are uh, not, <laughs> that are, can have a legitimate use, but are usually misused. And this is uh, much more problematic, and I would really encourage to also include that in uh, whatever treaty could be uh, negotiated, because that's, that's the main issue. And, and we see now, for example, just nearby in France with the Gilets Jaunes, the use of, of uh, this uh, tear gas, explosive tear gas. I mean, five hands have been torn off in six months. I mean, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a misuse of, of tools that are uh, legal, possibly, but that, that are not used correctly. And the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture that exists now for 30 years in Europe then can visit places of detention at any time, in any places of detention in any of the 47 uh, countries of the Council of Europe, is facing this misuse of tools uh, all the time. And what you said as well, like in places of detention, even if the tool, uh, the good is, is possibly legitimate use outside should be completely prohibited in places of detention. The use of tear gas, as you showed us, in a police cell should be prohibited as such, because then it's, um, uh, this is uh, clearly uh, torture. And, and in, in Poland recently, the European Committee found a, a person who uh, death in police custody from the use of uh, taser because the person was handcuffed uh, and immobilized and they used on several occasions this taser. So taser as such are not prohibited, but their use should be strictly regulated and should be prohibited on some, on some occasions. So we see this as a very, very positive development for all the reasons as well mentioned by Gerald before, but it's uh, only a first step. Uh, and, and we see that uh, prevention should be uh, continue on all different fronts and including then monitoring this use, uh, the, the, the implementation of this future treaty and here, the national preventive mechanisms in countries that have accepted, ratified the optional protocol can also contribute to monitor the existence of, this, of these tools, and we use the Omega handbook on that, um, and, and this monitoring should be, should be uh, also part of this, of, this, uh, of this treaty. Yeah, thanks. Can, can you tell us a little bit more, now that you can mention at the end, so implementation challenges and monitoring questions of what, what, what would we need in order to make a global ban if it is enacted, uh, and hopefully it will be, uh, how can we make it effective, right? What's necessary as next steps then? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, <laughs> as Gerald was saying, uh, it's good to have treaties and we have this prohibition um, of torture for uh, more than 70 years now and it still exists. So I don't know in terms of trade and there are, uh, in terms of trade treaty, what, are in, what is in place in terms of, of monitoring, but clearly uh, there need to be strict controls uh, from and, and regulations at the national level as well, and including uh, probably uh, maybe the role of NGOs as well, but the role of national preventive mechanisms that can at least enter places of detention and check whether uh, they found this type of tools in, uh, in, in the places, in the equipment of the police uh, and the law of enforcement and, and then make recommendations on, on this use. But the implementation is always a challenge uh, in terms of, of treaties and international law in, in, in general. But maybe in, in arm in uh, in general, there are other, other ways of, uh, of checking the, the implementation. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Andrew, I'll wait. <laughs> um, so drawing on your experience with the arms trade treaty, um, can you tell us a bit about the, what, what do you see as the next steps for this initiative? And if you also can look at a crystal ball and tell us the challenges, benefits to be gained from this initiative. Wow. Um, well, I think uh, one of the advantages of going down this route is that you do take it beyond those people who just work on human rights or even just work on torture. 
as has been mentioned. There are even distinguished professors of trade law in the room now, nodding their heads. Um, so we, we widen it out to trade lawyers, but also to arms control people and the commercial sector. And as the commissioner said, it, it, this should be everybody's business and not just those of us who work on this all the time. Thinking about the arms trade treaty, um, one of the things I would say not to do um, is not to try and have the, everybody in the room agree to a text. Because I think one of the faults in the process for the arms trade treaty is that there were some states that were never going to join this treaty, and I don't need to name them, and yet they insisted on certain clauses which would give you escape clauses for national security and so on. And people said, oh, well, if we can get them in the treaty, then, you know, let's compromise. And, of course, as soon as the thing was done, they walked away. And you have a text which is the lowest common denominator. And if you have a like-minded group, I would say agree to what the like-minded group are going to do and not let the outliers water down the text. Um, the other thing which is useful to think about in this context is that once you go down such a route, you asked about monitoring. Um, I think the arms trade treaty doesn't have a successful monitoring mechanism. There, there is no treaty body. There's no body of experts that can control this. It's even been written in such a way that if it comes before a national court, judges say, well, these are all questions that are dealt with normally by the executive, and these are questions which are very sensitive, and we really feel like we shouldn't interfere. And I would say, write the text so that it's clear that this is justiciable before a court, and a judge can say these, this material cannot be exported or imported because it goes against the treaty or na the national implementing legislation. And national implementing bodies and uh, sort of soft measures, if I can put it like that, are not going to work in this sphere. You, you need to have a licensing system. You need to make it a, a sort of a norm that nothing can leave the country unless there's a license. And you ought to be able to challenge that license in court. And, and that's what I feel um, quite strongly. I think I'll pause there. Just a quick follow up. But um, I was also wondering if there is going to be any legal implications of an, another new treaty and any concerns or issues that you foresee at this moment? I mean, one of the legal implications that I thought about on coming here, which I haven't seen in any of the literature, so tell me if I've got this completely wrong, but nobody talks about individual criminal responsibility. Now, Gerard mentioned complicity, but he meant the complicity of a state which allows this to happen. But what about the complicity of the individual seller who sells one of these spiky batons, for example, which is used for torture. The torture convention says that every state party, and there are 160, has to make complicity in torture a crime. So you ought to be able to prosecute that businessman for selling that as an accomplice to torture because he knows how it will be used, and if it is used, it's a substantial contribution to the crime. So I think to, to bring in some international criminal lawyers, which we didn't have for the arms trade treaty, and think about, as the torture convention allows you, criminal responsibility for not just using these weapons, but for supplying them. And that gets you much closer to the sorts of regimes relating to prohibited landmine use and so on. And I think one could benefit from looking across to that side of what goes on here in Geneva. All right, think, thanks a lot to everybody. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to open it up to the audience so we can have a bit of a question and answer session, even though we don't have that much time. But maybe before that, I would like to ask the commissioner maybe for kind of a brief response on kind of some of the suggestions, ideas, and comments and concerns that have been raised. Sort of, uh, how do you see the prospects of these being addressed in the current negotiations? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for, for all the, the input and ideas and... and um, Warnings not to do I took good note here. Well, this is obviously now in a United Nations process. I mean, we have the, this cooperation among those who want to do, and we have already started cooperation, and then we can go further. But uh, what the, the um, resolution is asking is a first step. It's for the, the Secretary General to appoint uh, a group of experts who would look at all these details, enforcement, and where do you go with, with 
can, can, you, can you draw that line or can you overcome that line of the goods only used for torture or dual use? Um, how, how do you monitor, how do you check up, and, and so on. And then the, there is a, a sort of feasibility study. What is realistic uh, to do? And that will take some time. Hopefully that could be uh, accepted next year, uh, can be presented next year to, to the United Nations. But first we need to get uh, a majority to vote in favor of that very careful resolution, uh, of course. But all these things are, 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 are important to look at in that, that feasibility study that the European Union will finance, by the way. So it, you mean countries can vote in favor, it will not um, bear any economic costs for them. Um, but but uh, I think it, it is really important to think through all the steps here on, on enforcement, on, on monitoring, on the definitions, on the follow-up, on the, the uh, how, how do you update, and so on. And then some countries have already started. We have been advising and, and helping some countries to build up their own capacity to, to make sure that their national law is now being sharpened and how do you... Um, how how do, you, do you catch those in your national legislation, which obviously some countries would want to go further. And I fully agree with you that in the end, if you want to have something, you, you need to... There will be countries who would just refuse to engage at all. Or even if they engage, you know that they will not uh, be there. But, but there will still be a lot of compromises to be made, uh, unfortunately. But that's why we can have these parallel processes. But those who want to go further, we can do that. But in parallel working, um, and I hope that, that you and your colleagues can, can provide that input all along the process on how we, we go about, both in the sort of group of, of more ambitious countries, but also hopefully we'll get uh, work on this on the, the international level, because that, that is the only way. And you, you recognize, Barbara, also, um, I mean, the, the difficulties of, of implementation of international treaties. It's there. We don't have a world police. Uh, so so we, we shouldn't be shy about that. But maybe there could be some innovative thinking uh, as well, because this is uh, clearly um, something that, that we noticed many, many countries uh, and um, Organizations, obviously, uh, stakeholders, NGOs, think tanks, and so on, are, are engaged in and have a lot of experience. But it's sensitive politically because we talk about, you mentioned migration, yes, detention centers. We mentioned fight against terrorism, which, of course, is, is there. It's important to, to fight terrorism, but the tools and how, how do you, I mean, so, so we, we step into very sensitive political areas. But, but I want to thank really the panel for, for, for good uh, input and, um, and a suggestion. I hope we can keep in contact too in this whole, uh, this whole process, as we have so far. Of course, yeah. Thank you again. And shall we open the floor for questions? But we don't have a lot of time. Please introduce yourself briefly and please be brief. Yeah? <laughs> uh, I saw a hand first here. Uh, gentleman over there. My name is uh, Jamil Shadi, I'm a journalist from Brazil. I'd like to thank Gerald, not only for what he said now, but for the press release you published yesterday. Um, this same government denies that uh, the dictatorship exists, and President Bolsonaro actually says that he favors torture. So my question to Madame uh, Malmstrom, are you okay signing a trade deal with Brazil at this moment, which will be seen in Brazil as a prize and acceptance to this government worldwide. Thank you. Shall we collect more before we finish? Yeah, let's collect some more questions. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. My name is Dr. Katerina Rosenblatt, and I am an American. However, with that said, we have problems in America too. And I think, I think you uh, addressed one of them, which is holding criminals accountable. So when you said holding traffickers accountable, I can tell you that as a survivor of human trafficking and torture, that that is very much needed. If you want to make an example internationally and help end torture and trafficking at the same time, I would encourage you to include holding traffickers accountable as well for their use of torture and torture tactics. And you can start with the wording that the commissioner said, which is torture degrades and debases one's humanity. Thank you so much for saying that. And God bless you all for your work. 
Thank you very much. My name is Defne Gönenç. I would like to ask you why didn't you include also production of tools of torture in the agreement? That would be the final and uh, definitive, uh, the most effective solution. Thank you. We have a hand up there. Uh, th thank you so much for the great work that you are doing. Um, my name is Tafazo Christmas. I work for an organization called International Bridges for, uh, to Justice. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm currently studying here in Geneva. I have two questions for the panelists. Uh, the first question that I have is quite basic. Um, do you have any data in relation to how much is being generated from the trade uh, of tools of torture in terms of monetary terms? I know we are all human rights activists, uh, human rights um, oriented people, and we usually focus on human rights issues. But for states, uh, the, the dollar speaks. How much does this trade generate? Uh, how much is this uh, trade worth? In, uh, if you have that statistic to help us also to just assess the gravity of the problem. I would have wondered as well if there was time to just a heat map in terms of the suppliers and the consumers to see how the trade, the tools are being are flowing across the world. Then the next question that I have, which I think is more burning, is to do with um, the contextual issue that you raised. Uh, for the developing world, I know it's an, for the developed world, I think it's an issue to say we need to regulate the, 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 the trade in tools of torture. But for the developing world, you realize that there's a lot of advocacy around the use of non-lethal weapons because currently most of the law enforcement agents, they have AK-47s and people are protesting. So the civil society movement is pushing to say, let's use rubber bullets, let's use tear gas, so it seems as if we are going the opposite direction now when we are saying let's ban those particular tools when in the develop, developing world people are actually advocating to say let's use non-lethal means to try and protect citizens, to try and protect even uh, police officers. In some countries there are high police fatality rates so they are trying to mechanize, they have drones, they have some way of in protecting the police officers themselves. How do you address those, that kind of context where people are looking for solutions and yet we're also trying to stop the, the use of non-lethal weapons as, uh, weapon, as tools of torture. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Peter Splinter. I previously represented Amnesty International in Geneva. Very interesting panel, thank you. Although I do wish you'd had a skeptic on the, the panel. Um, if there were unlimited resources in, in, to devote to the United Nations process, this, pro this proposal would make sense. But uh, negotiating a, a treaty instrument with all of the administration is going to take human resources, it's going to take financial resources, it's going to take time, and it's going to take political capital. And there are much bigger um, human rights issues out there that aren't addressed. Gerald referred to the, the export of um, software that's used to, to, to monitor political dissidents, journalists, leading sometimes to their, their murder, um, artificial intelligence, Facebook. There, there are big issues out there. And I would like to hear um, from Commissioner Malmstrom why this, when there are so many other big questions, why this in the UN where... Andrew was hinting, but I don't think he said it, an Ottawa process could be used for something like this where you don't need to worry about the lowest common denominator that a UN process inevitably drives to. Um, but again, thank you, it was a very interesting panel. Okay, uh, definitely two words directly to me. In, in general, I mean, exactly the inclusion and the definitions and the limits and what is possible, this is what would be the outcome of, 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 of the study to see what can be done. So, so, I mean, there are lots of, of wish lists what we could include in this, but we need to see what, what is realistic in the end. And that's why we have asked and also offered to finance a, fe a feasibility study in order not to waste too much of the resources of the United Nation that we will pay for this and then setting up a, a group of experts because I think this is really important. Torture. Does Amnesty not think torture is important? Yeah, they're one of hundreds and thousands and thousands of people who are being... Yeah, yeah, but that, that, that you can, can, of course, is... But in, this is, uh, as I said, this is a, a, a two-step process. Torture is there, there is being um, 
you sell um, um, products that you can use for, for, for torture, how can we stop this? And we started this reflection uh, internally with some trade ministers, and in, including Argentina and uh, Mongolia, and that came this initiative. First, to try to do something among us and gather an alliance, which can go much further, I agree with you, and which, where we can build on our own resources and share experiences and so on. And then in addition, let's see if we can also go the United Nations track. It might be a big you know, close door, it, it won't work. Uh, maybe, maybe you, you have maybe longer experience and you, you see it won't, won't work. But at least let's try. But that doesn't exclude the other process, whatever you want to call it, the alliance of those 64 or 65 countries who have signed up and who are willing to be quite, uh, quite advanced in this uh, and who have already started cooperating. Uh, on the, um, um, the, the your, your, your question from the gentleman from Brazil, uh, well, by no means do we agree with everything that the president of Brazil says or proposes or, or claims. Uh, a trade agreement is not an endorsement of national policies. If it were, there were, would be few countries we would be trading with uh, in that regard. Um, a trade agreement with, with Brazil and the three other countries of Mercosur, which is in the making, we're not done yet, but we are negotiating this since many years ago, will be when we, when we achieve this, uh, if, but I say when, because we, it's, it's, I think it can be done, will be uh, embedded, as we very often do in the European Union, in a partnership and association agreement, which is a broader political framework where we cooperate in a variety of areas. Trade is only one of these, this is the trade agreement, where there is clear uh, space and, and you know, commitments from both sides to discuss, for instance, civil society issues, um, human rights issues, uh, uh, environmental issues, deforestation, uh, etc. will be in there as well. And we think getting at least around the table and having possibility to discuss this can provide a platform to possibly uh, influence some of these uh, proposals. Then there are proposals and then there are statements, uh, of course. But um, so, so they, they, it will create, I'm not sure it's going to, to solve it, it will create platforms to discuss the issues you mentioned and other issues where, where we are in disagreement, absolutely. I think these, those were more concretely directed to me. And Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I can address a, uh, a few of the, uh, uh, the questions. Yes, uh, production. Ideally, um, it would be, uh, and logically, of course, it makes sense to prohibit inherent, uh, the production as well as the trade and use in inherently abusive equipment. And um, that has, that element, uh, uh, prohibition of production, has been recognized um, as part of the global fight against torture in the biannual uh, omnibus uh, torture uh, resolution that UNGA passes every, uh, every two years. Uh, because by uh, just dealing with trade, you don't stop the production of the equipment and the, the use inside that country of, of such equipment. And of course, even though you might try to, you know, to regulate trade, um, if you ensure uh, uh, a prohibition on production, then there's no goods uh, uh, um, uh, to worry about the trade of, uh, because some, some companies and some states might try and evade um, international trade controls. So ideally, of course, I agree, uh, um, production, prohibition of production uh, would be uh, the best course. But I, I, I leave it to uh, um, uh, the commissioner uh, to, uh, and others in this room to uh, discuss what is politically uh, possible internationally uh, at the moment. And I believe that this process, hopefully, you know, starting um, soon, uh, whereby uh, the Secretary General uh, um, uh, gets views of, of member states uh, and, and, and then a negotiating uh, process develops, Ho you know, hopefully that will see what is feasible uh, at the international level. But picking up on, on what Andrew um, w was saying earlier, uh, what's, whatever's happening at the international level, level state, individual states have a responsibility, uh, a, a, a state responsibility to um, prohibit production, trade, and use of inherently abusive equipment. So they can and should introduce national measures now, and there's nothing stopping them, in theory, from doing that now at the national level uh, to address their obligations to uh, prevent and prohibit torture. So that's uh, one... Uh, one question. The other question was um, less lethal weapons. Um, 
Yeah, in my presentation, I tried to distinguish between inherently abusive equipment, which needs to be prohibited, and uh, uh, law enforcement equipment, which should be controlled. So, of course, you know, it's recognized that, that there's a range of law enforcement equipment, tear gas, kinetic impact uh, weapons, that in certain circumstances um, have a legitimate use. And if you don't use them, and you should provide law enforcement officials with the appropriate equipment so that they use the least, least amount of force necessary. It should be proportionate, uh, 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 targeted, uh, and necessary. So if you don't uh, provide and train uh, uh, law enforcement officials with the appropriate tools, and they only have uh, uh, um, firearms, they'll use firearms. So yes, of course, uh, less lethal weapons have a role to play, but the trade and use of such equipment needs to be stringently uh, controlled. Final question was the scale of the trade. Um, and the, the honest answer is, I don't know what the scale of the trade is. And it partially depends on how you define tools of torture. If you uh, um, just talk about inherently abusive equipment, then I'd say it's, you know, it's, quite, it's quite small. Uh, um, but we, because states don't control it, they, can't, uh, they don't license it, then they can't give us uh, um, the figures are for that trade. Some commercial companies uh, um, have uh, tried to explore the scale of the less lethal weapons trade and the non-lethal weapons trade, which covers some of the categories of, of goods of concern, and that's been estimated in the multi-billion uh, 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 range. So, um, yeah, I think that's it from me. Maybe just on the process, um, I think the problems with some of the processes in the past is that they were conceived as arms control processes or prohibited weapons processes. And those have traditionally happened by consensus. So if you set up your conference or your negotiation and you say, we're going to decide everything by consensus, everybody in the room has a veto and you're operating at the lowest common denominator. If you set this up as a human rights initiative, there's no need for consensus. Human rights texts can be adopted by vote and you won't be held hostage by the most difficult state in the room. So I think it, it, it depends, you know, how you work out what committee you go under in New York and how you present it. But I would say that's um, incredibly important. On this other point about what can be done at the national level, maybe this is more for my students in the room. Um, at the national level, as you say, there's nothing to stop a state from criminalizing complicity in torture. And it can happen. But when I reread the convention, I noticed something that was interesting. It says states must introduce complicity in torture by persons, not by individuals, but by persons. So any state um, which is a party to this treaty can criminalize corporate criminal responsibility for the selling of these goods, the manufacture of these goods, or trading in those goods. And I think that would send a huge message, whatever we do at the international level, if states start to introduce national legislation that makes it a corporate criminal offense to trade or deal in these weapons. Uh, no, may, may, maybe just a comment as well to uh, Peter Splinter and, and the fact that uh, why, why this issue. Um, maybe just to say that uh, on the, on the non-lethal weapons as well. Uh, just to say that I think this is just one route to go, and it's not the only answer. And I, I think the founder of the APT used to say that there is no panacea for the fight against torture, and we just have to take a series of different measures at different levels, and this is just one possible option, and I think we have to continue with all the others, and uh, the majority of, of, of torture happens during interrogation by the police, it's uh, for forced confessions, and, and uh, here we are trying to propose as well a, a new solution, which is guidelines on investigative interviewing and, and safeguards, which is introducing a new way not on interrogation, but on hearings to get the truth and, and not to force the false confessions and the use of torture. So I think that's a, another route to follow. And then on, on the issue of uh, non-lethal uh, tools versus uh, use of firearms, I don't think we should uh, put them in uh, opposition and uh, either or, because uh, I, I think, and that's um, what the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture says as well, that you should apply basically the same rules in terms of when to use uh, uh, non-lethal 
uh, tools, which is, of course, uh, proportionality, necessity, but also subsidiarity and, and um, a precaution. And of course, it should be accompanied with other uh, issues such as, as uh, training, clear instructions, and reporting mechanisms to uh, avoid uh, um, uh, misuse of these, of these tools. Maybe just coming in, um, um, also to pin Peter to some extent. In torture, one of the worst things, or one of the reasons why we have torture is confession. So here's my confession in some way. Uh, initially, when Amnesty started campaigning on the, on the issue, I felt there are so many more ways that torture happens. Is it the right focus? Um, but I came a long way in, in changing my perspective, and that's my confession in some way. Because I see a lot of opportunities here. Um, when I listen to you, Andrew, I, I hear a lot of opportunities and way things are framed in legal terms that go beyond the conventional way we do it. Um, and I see a way in, in lawmaking often that it is about framing discussions as well. I would like to see this as framing the discussion about business and human rights in a very concrete terms when it comes to universal absolute prohibition. I'd like to see it as a framing of discussions about the broader issue of business and human rights, for example. I'd like to see it as a broader discussion on where's the gravitas on the problem when it comes to international cooperation and torture. And I think it is on the complicity side. Trade is one coin of this complicity side. But you asked me earlier, what would our local members say about this? And I think it is about what are the levels of engagement with abusive law enforcement, military, and other intelligence services? Mm -hmm. And there, of course, if I look just at the EU level, we have other instruments. We have the GCPS Plus and, and, and things like that. And we would like to see that this complicity with law enforcement becomes part of this. Not only do we ratify the Convention Against Torture, which is one of the questions that is usually addressed, but really when it comes to the heart of, we, we legitimize through our cooperation um, abusive law enforcement. So I would like to see the discussion on this treaty, or whatever instrument it will be, as a, as a part of reframing the, the discussion on those, those points. Um, so that's just what I wanted to share. All right, I think we're <clears throat> coming to the end of our lot of time. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Since, since you've been targeted directly, yeah. can I can. So. Hi, thank you. Kevin Whalen from Amnesty International, uh, located in Geneva. And, and just to, to make the point, I mean, um, we view this uh, ultimately as a torture issue, right? And torture is absolutely prohibited. Um, and we support bringing attention to this. Um, to the topic of the tools of torture. Um, we support uh, addressing torture in various different uh, avenues, including through uh, focusing on trade. Um, we have colleagues in New York who are working diligently on the negotiations. I would just want to emphasize one thing that Michael had said. I think that it's critical for uh, the process to uh, address not just those uh, goods that would be inherently banned, um, but also those things that would, would need to be uh, regulated. So anyway, I just wanted to... <laughs> All right. So thanks. Our time is, uh, time is almost up. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the panelists really for, I think, what was a stimulating discussion, and especially all of you kind of for participating in the discussion, which has brought up kind of many more uh, concerns and issues that obviously kind of should make us keep thinking about how to design this right and how to how to think about implementing uh, an idea that I think is kind of everybody agrees is very worthwhile. Uh, we have made disagreements about the priorities and what else to do, but uh, but generally yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously a positive direction. And of course the question is kind of how to make happen progress in the direction that we've identified. Um, and one of the questions I've, I've I've had, but well, we can't really discuss it further, is kind of what do you do with, an, uh, with a possible displacement of production and sale of those goods from the countries that sign up that are in the like-minded group to other places, right? Especially, so that seems to be business opportunities um, out there. Kind of, is there something one can do about this and how could one address this? Also, displacement from high-tech to low-tech torture, right? That's something that 
came up. Um, uh, so how can we do that? The egg example obviously is uh, is one that kind of sort of is very difficult difficult to tackle. Um, so I guess we need quite a bit of creative thinking really for how to deal with this as a particular problem. Maybe we could call it a weakest link problem here uh, that we need to tackle, and that is not maybe different from some of the other. Uh, problems that we've dealt with through like-minded processes um, and, uh, and the like. Then there was another, maybe a last point uh, that Gerald's uh, last uh, point brought me to, was how is that related to the broader movement towards business and human rights uh, responsibility, kind of where obviously Geneva is, a, is one of the places where the discussion is taking place and there's the current negotiations over a legally binding instrument on business and human rights where the EU obviously has a much more ambivalent, I might say, kind of position. Uh, so somehow it seems kind of the two things are very closely related uh, and uh, holding businesses to account for ethically, uh, morally reprehensible behavior kind of is, uh, is obviously there. So question as well, shouldn't one also go then the other direction? Um, but there are lots of more issues. We don't have the time for them uh, this afternoon. But I thank very much all the panelists, and especially the commissioner, uh, for sharing their time with us and their insights. Um, and I invite everybody um, up for coffee or something of the sort uh, on the kind of um, uh, up, up the stairs so we can continue some of the conversations informally during this time. But thank you very much. Thank you.